morning or afternoon, wherever you may be right now. Thank you all so much for joining us um, today for this Cambridge webinar. So we want to spend the next hour featuring some amazing work that is happening in African-American studies. Specifically, we want to present our new series titled African-American Literature in Transition, which consists of 17 volumes that track transitions in African-American literature from the 18th century to the present. The series is the brainchild of Professor Jocelyn Moody. Um, for those of you who don't know, she is the Sue E. Denman Distinguished Chair in American Literature and Director of the African-American Literatures and Cultures Institute at the University of Texas, San Antonio. Jocelyn serves as general editor for the series. My name, as Holly just mentioned, is Cassandra Smith. I am an associate professor of English at the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, and I serve as the series' associate editor. Due to unforeseen circumstances, Joycelyn sadly couldn't join us today. Um, it turns out that over the weekend, she developed an acute allergic reaction to some medication, and so now she has to undergo close observation in a hospital setting. But she did want me to pass along her regrets and her immense gratitude that you have joined us today. So this series is some six years in the making. Um, Jocelyn started this project back in 2015, and then I came on board in 2019 to help manage the workload involved in channeling the brilliance of 20 editors across 17 volumes and more than 200 chapter contributors. So we are thrilled to see the first products of Joyce and his vision materialize in the publication of the first five volumes in the series, which we will talk about today. In some ways, this series extends the work of editors Mary Emma Graham and Jerry Ward Jr., whose Cambridge History of African American Literature exists as a single volume published by Cambridge in 2011. The aim of that volume, as Graham and Ward note in their introduction, is to present a quote, fairly complete chronological description of African-American literature in the United States from the 17th to the 21st centuries, and to illustrate how the literature comprises orature, that is oral literature, and printed text simultaneously. Their volume presents a series of new and intriguing questions and perspectives on the discrete traditions and movements that comprise African-American literature, including its indebtedness to orality. Our series, African-American Literature in Transition, is the effort to present new conceptualizations, new ways of telling, and new ways of reading African-American literature across traditions and movements. What is more, our series addresses issues of method, perspective, archives, and especially context to consider the ways in which key socio-political moments fueled the origin and transformation of African-American literature. Volumes in the series address the ripple effect of, for example, the American Revolution, draconian laws, slave revolts, political parties, social movements, and community institutions on the creation production, distribution, and reception of literature by writers of African descent between, again, 1750 and the 21st century. The series emphasizes the fluid nature of African-American literature, its malleability and adaptability across centuries. Together, the volumes in the series address questions such as the following. What was or is African-American literature? What constitutes an archive when examining the evolutionary nature of this literature? In other words, what kinds of sources provide information about the transitions informing African-American literature? How might we understand this literature as fluid, constantly in a state of transition, but also as something that's fixed or stable? What does stability look like in the study of African-American literature? And what are the stakes involved in thinking about African-American literature as being in a state of flux? Now, with this general overview in mind, I now present to you the editors for the five volumes just out from Cambridge. Each editor will take a couple minutes to introduce you to their specific volume. Then we will all engage in a dialogue designed to highlight some of the major critical interventions of the series. And we will leave about 20 minutes or so at the end to answer any questions you might have. So please submit your questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom. 
Okay, so to do this, we'll just go in chronological order, which means we'll start with Jasmine. Jasmine, if you could please introduce yourself and then tell us a little about your volume. Thank you, Cassandra. And thank you to Joyce Lynn Moody uh, for her vision uh, and commitment to the series. Uh, my name is Jasmine Nicole Cobb. I am the Baca Foundation Associate Professor of Art, Art History and Visual Studies in African and African-American Studies at Duke University. Uh, I have uh, previously written on representations and writings by free Black women uh, in the slave era, both their writing and their artworks. And so I approached the challenge of compiling a volume on African-American literature from 1800 to 1830 with an interest in free people uh, and diverse kinds of uh, text or literatures. African-American Literature in Transition, Volume 2, chronicles and interprets authors, texts, and cultural transitions of the years between 1800 and 1830. Divided into four parts, this volume takes up well-known figures but explores their themes in ways that reveal transformations that made their literary production possible. African American literature of the early national period was produced on the run amid slavery's penchant for backbreaking labor and before the widespread organization of US abolition. African American authors of this period were not writing with the support of a highly organized black public sphere, such as the one that emerged by 1830. So much as they were creating those institutions with intellectual labor and cultural production that is the subject of this volume. Accordingly, essays here examine transformations in the ways people of African descent thought of themselves and about whiteness, in addition to their ruminations on slavery, justice, and national belonging. So if you look here at the table of contents, you'll see a variety of sources as part of the discussions within the text. Uh, artwork by painter Joshua Johnston, born in slavery, who did a lot of illustrations of um, free whites in Baltimore. Uh, the, the discussion of Black women's heroism in the Freedom's Journal, discussed by Bridget Fielder. The idea of empire in Black writing, taken up by Joseph Rezek, and Black entrepreneurship, explored by Preeti Kanakamandala. In the text, you'll find some figures that are well known to us in this period, such as David Walker, but taken up from a variety of perspectives. Overall, this volume contends that the material conditions of the years between 1800 and 1830 rendered Black authors and much of African-American literature out of bounds, either inappropriate for public discussion or outside of the confines of um, printed books, if you will. Thank you. Okay, um, next we have Dan. Thanks, Cassie. Good morning, everyone, or um, good time of day, wherever it is you happen to be located. It's, um, it's morning in Alabama. My name is Benjamin Fagan. I'm an associate professor of English at Auburn University in Alabama in the United States. And um, I first just want to say thank you and a, a huge thanks to Joycelyn Moody um, and Cassie Smith and everyone at, at Cambridge for making this, 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 this project possible. Um, you know, Cassie mentioned that she's been involved in this since I think 2019, um, you said. Uh, I've been here since 2015, so it's been a <laughs> it's been a a journey, and it's it's been a pleasure, and it's a it, it, you know if Joycelyn was it's too bad Joycelyn isn't here, but I just want to express my sincere sincere appreciation to Joycelyn for um, including uh, me in this in this endeavor. It, it, I've learned so much, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity. I also want to express my thanks to all the contributors who um, wrote for the volume uh, that uh, I was asked to edit. And um, that volume is African-American Literature in Transition, 1830 to 1850. And it really is um, uh, a testament to the, the strength and, and brilliance of the contributors 
um, that this this volume has any coherence and um, and any sort of uh, uh, of argument. But but what it is is a collection of of amazing work and um, from some amazing people, and it wouldn't be possible without without them. I think my job is simply to um, assist and then get out of the way, which is what I'm going to try to do quickly here too. Um, but that's how I see editorial work. And my own work is on, uh, focuses on, on the black press and on editors. So I, I've thought a lot about what it means to be an editor in this, in this process. And, and the models I like the best are, are those who, who let the work uh, speak for itself and, and try to get out of the way. So, um, that's the ethic that I've tried to, to practice, um, in this project. The, um, the focus of the volume broadly conceived is on the relationship. And this comes from um, a very early statement of what the African-American literature and transition broadly, uh, the project broadly was, was, uh, was trying to do or is trying to do. And that is to explore the relationship between the literature and lived experience. And so all the contributions um, to the 1830 to 1850 volume uh, take up that question of what is the relationship between what may be a particular event or institution or other manifestation of lived experience and some kind of literature, art, um, expression. And to move uh, beyond a discussion of text context, which I think many of us are familiar with and really just kind of look at the interplay of how the literature is shaped, but also shapes um, lived experiences that we, we sometimes read as separate from um, its expression. And so to really look at that, at that connection. And those uh, explorations take up a variety of kinds of sources and a variety of kinds of writers, um, periodicals, school archives, poetry volumes, novels, multilingual, explorations. Um, there is work on French language literature, on Spanish language literature, um, and uh, explore um, how the literature operates across and it, it sort of tracks multiple geographic scales. And so um, the volume is organized in terms of local, national, and transnational transitions. And those, um, those section headings come from the pieces themselves, come from the, the chapters themselves. They weren't imposed, they sort of became the organizing principle once the chapters had been written. So this is what the writers of the time were interested in, exploring these different geographic scales and crossing these different geographic scales um, through their work. And I found it interesting that Jasmine talked about how there's a familiar figure like David Walker, who's taken up from a number of perspectives in the volume that she edited. David Walker is also a major figure in the 1830 to 1850 volume. Um, this is what happens when you publish three editions of a work, sometimes in the 1820s and then in 1830, and in, in many ways, and in 1848. And so in many ways frames um, the years of the, the volume uh, that, um, that I was involved in. And also what Walker invites us to do is to uh, trouble those boundaries, any of those temporal boundaries, spatial boundaries, political boundaries uh, that we think we're putting into place, he, he bursts them wide open. And so um, he has taken up in a number of, of, of essays, but also there are essays on uh, New Orleans schools on um, Jasmine wrote a, a brilliant essay on Black women contributors to the Liberator, so on white abolitionist newspapers, on um, literary societies in um, New York and Philadelphia, on the relationship between Nat Turner's insurrection and the poetry of George Moses Horton, on the, the impact of West Indian emancipation on African American literature. I'm not just reading off the, the, the table of contents, what I'm trying to do is is give a, a view of, of the breadth uh, of what the contributors explored. So um, that is, is essentially what this volume is doing, looking at the relationship between text and lived experience across a variety of scales. And again, I'm just so grateful to the contributors for writing such a beautiful volume and, um, and to the editors, the, the, the series editors for the opportunity for me to be involved. Thank you. All right, thanks, Ben. Um, okay, so we have a fifth 
editor who couldn't make it today uh, due to some unforeseen um, circumstances. And so I am going to just briefly mention a couple things about her um, volume and then we'll move to the next. So the, the third volume that we'll talk about was edited by <clears throat> Teresa Zakadnik, who's a professor in the Department of English and Film Studies at the University of, of Alberta. Her volume covers the period 1850 to 1865. In Teresa's words, the period between 1850 and 1865 is a crucial period during which, quote, recognizable literary genres, such as autobiographical narrative, the novel and lyric poetry, joined oral forms, such as speeches and sermons, as well as writing we today think of as belonging to other disciplines, such as history and social science. Um, Zakadnik notes that readers and writers of this era understood and actively cultivated a co-constitutive relation linking political activism and politicized spaces with literature and its development. At mid-century, Black American literature circulated primarily in newspapers and magazines, making possible a different relation between the reader and the world through seriality and the rhythms of weekly and monthly publication. That mode of circulation also rendered what we call a literary tradition both precarious and ubiquitous at the same time. As periodicals folded under financial pressure and new ones emerged, papers were passed around within communities and who readers were understood to be was expansive since African-Americans were accessing literature in communal reading settings that meant they need not have been textually literate. This literature itself was likewise expansive, challenging the nation state's geographic boundaries by expanding beyond them in its representation and wide dissemination of black thought. In other words, African-American literature, its emergence and development have always been complex. This volume offers one way of approaching that complexity in the middle of the 19th century through its tripartite structure, focusing on, and you'll notice from the table of contents, um, the, the sections for the volume. First section is citizenship and identity formations in transition, and then generic transitions in textual circulation and black geographies in transition. Okay, and that's a little bit about the 1850s volume. And next we will move on to the volume from Eric. Thanks for Professor Smith. And, and just a quick, before I start, thank you for all of your work, um, keeping us going steadfast and much appreciated. I'm Eric Gardner. I teach at Saginaw Valley State University in Michigan. And my most recent book is Black Print Unbound, The Christian Recorder, African-American Literature and Periodical Culture. And I'm the editor of the volume on Reconstruction. And our volume began with a set of basic premises. First, that African-Americans continued to make wondrous contributions like those outlined by Jasmine, Ben, Teresa, and, and Cassie, uh, uh, post-bellum, pre-Harlem, to quote Chestnut via Barbara McCaskill and Carolyn Gebhardt. We also built the premise that these contributions have often been downplayed, ignored, dismissed, or hidden by American history. And thus that we needed to attend not only to recovering authors and texts, but also to exploring how such recovery challenges the very foundations of our broader formations of African-American literature and American cultural history. In this, we recognize that our genealogy traces at least partially directly to W.E.B. Du Bois classic, Black Reconstruction in America, an essay toward a history of the part which black folk played in the attempt to reconstruct democracy in America, 1860 to 1880. And besides Du Bois, we recognize that we stand on the shoulders of giants here. Francis Smith Foster, Henry Louis Gates, Carla Peterson, Bill Andrews, John Ernest, just to name a few. And here, let me quickly praise Joycelyn Moody, who is also, to my mind, one of those giants without whom this volume and this series would not have existed. I remember those conversations in 2015, and I remember how hard she pushed and how wisely she weighed questions. She has mentored so many of us in such valuable ways. And I know that I went into helping create my volume with the premise that I wanted the essays to do the kinds of work that Joycelyn does every day. 
In this vein, we recognize that the series emphasis on transitions meant that we had to think about reconstruction as not just 1865 to 1877, but along with the Civil War and much of American history as an unfinished revolution filled with massive unresolved questions that we see every day. And that our work thus would be initiatory, generative, hopefully germinal rather than definitive, that we would offer steps forward rather than any easy ends. To do this work, we organized the essays into three sections. The first is Citizenships, Textualities, and Domesticities, and it contains wonderful essays by Derek Spires, Stephanie Farrar, Renetta Davis, and me. Our second section is Persons and Bodies, that contains essays by Kathy Glass, Nazira Wright, Keith Green, and Bridget Fielder. And then finally, Memories, Materialities, and Locations, which shares work by Cody Mars, Janet Neary, Sharita Johnson, and Catherine Adams. You'll see familiar figures here, uh, Francis Harper, William Wells Brown, and a number of folks who uh, even specialists in the field may barely know, uh, woven together in exciting ways that in Ben's mind, uh, uh, Ben's words uh, uh, really speak consciously to the sense of lived experience and the ways in which text functioned. I could gush about each of these essays. They all do amazing work. And it was a real honor to work with each of the contributors and they have my deepest thanks. But I'll end there because I hope that you read their work. Um, and then more than that even, I hope that you join the conversations that they open. And I'm looking forward to our conversation here momentarily. Thanks, Eric. Much appreciated. Okay, and, and then we're going to um, have Shirley come in and talk about our fifth volume. Thank you so much. Um, and good morning, good afternoon to everyone as well. Uh, my name is Shirley Moody Turner. I am an associate professor of English and African American Studies at Penn State. I want to add my um, thank yous to the chorus of thank yous, praising Joycelyn for her um, vision and her generosity, her mentorship, um, and her contributions to the field with this project, but also throughout her entire career. Um, so a, a big thank you to Joycelyn, and I'm looking forward to talking later to more about um, the process and being part of the pro process of, of seeing this series come to fruition. Um, and I want to add my thanks too to Professor Smith um, for helping to, to usher this volume through to its final um, stages. And I, I want to add thanks as well to the volume contributors, um, which hopefully I'll have a chance to, to talk about the, some of their essays, at least um, briefly in a little more specificity as we continue. Um, but just such a great group of contributors to get to work with. And I consider that one of the real um, joys of, of doing this project. So um, this volume, the African-American Literature in Transition 1900 to 1910, takes a decade that while critically situated at the beginning of the 20th century, still tends to get overlooked in conventional literary histories. This is a period that comes just after what we typically recognize as the nadir or low point of African-American life, in which it is often thought of um, as a moment that didn't quite see the same kind of political activity as the decades before, or the kind of literary flowering that would happen in the decades to follow. And so one of the real contributions of this volume was um, drawing on kind of new ways to read, understand, and recognize the incredible productivity and importance of this transitional decade. Um, and so this is really, the volume was really about um, how to mark um, African-American literature that takes shape in this moment. And so at some level there is, we see in this period, a kind of collective working out of the response to Jim Crow segregation, we see a kind of intentional building of an infrastructure to support and establish um, space for Black literature that was both national and international in scope. We see a kind of continued challenging of white supremacy and showing the ways in which it continued to shape society, but also um, was connected in a kind of global struggle. And so the volume, we 
decided to divide it into four parts um, based on on, um, feedback we got along the way, which also speaks to the range of collaboration that took place that um, I think a a series of this magnitude not only includes the editors, the contributors, um, but also all of the people who who read and provided feedback. So um, we we divided it into four parts, as you can see in the table of contents, um, looking at transitions in ideas around authorship, publishing, and the visual arts that take place in this decade um, with brilliant essays from Laura Helton, Ashley Knight, I'm sorry, Alicia Knight, and um, Rhonda Raymond. And then in the second part, we looked at transitions in aesthetics, genre, and form. And so looking at some of the ways in which ideas around aesthetics were taking shape both within a kind of national context, but also moving into to different spaces um, beyond the kind of bounds of, of the US. Um, in the third section, we, we looked at transitions that were happening in relation to leadership um, and ideas around leadership and what it meant to reimagine um, what Black leadership and and representation might look like in this kind of pivotal moment. And then the final section, we reimagined um, different geographies and different kind of um, geographic networks that could reshape some of the more conventional ways um, of thinking about African-American literature. And so thinking about both different spaces within the US So thinking about the frontier and and what did that mean at the turn of the 20th century, but also thinking um, in, again, in in a a global context um, in relation to reimagining a kind of racial consciousness within, but also beyond U.S. national um, constructs. And so each of the essays really was about trying to, to think through um, what it meant to to reimagine and imagine African American literature and cultural production in this moment, and to do it in relation to you know a broad range of of networks. So I will stop there, but I'm excited to um, begin the, to to engage and launch into the conversation. Thank you all so much for giving us a quick snapshot of your volumes. A couple of things I do want to point out um, to attendees is that like if if you have been following along with the dates and the chronology, then you'll see that um, there was a little break in the chronology between Eric and Shirley's volumes. And I do want to point out that we do have a a volume six um, that addresses the two decades, so from 1880 to 1900. Um, but we are presenting here the five vo- volumes that are either like out in print right now or will be um, very, very shortly. I also want to note that the very first volume that starts the series is one that covers the years from 1750 to 1800. So there is a volume then that precedes the one um, from Jasmine. So I, I just wanted to clarify that real quick. So um, in, the, in the next couple of moments, if um, y'all will. Um, be so so kind. There, there is one question I would like to start us off with. And Shirley started talking about this in her comments about how one of the values of um, your volume from 1900 to 1910 is that it really shows us that there's this misconception, right, that that there was a lack of um, the literary productivity in that decade. And so that's one of the major contributions for your volume. I'm wondering if all of you guys can take like just a minute or two and tell us what you see as like some of the most salient points or, or takeaways from your volume that that people might find um, particularly that people might find particularly insightful. I think one of the things that volume two does and something that um, Joycelyn was really helpful in pushing me uh, to make clear as an editor is that in the period of uh, 1800 to 1830, there is an immense body of work produced by African-Americans, um, all things considered, right? That slavery um, is not only still vibrant, but is, is, is growing or um, becoming even more central um, to US identity. Uh, and so to, to find um, 
not only what kind of literary activity um, people of African descent are up to, but also to think diversely about authorship meant to mm -hmm. think about a diverse array of sources, um, not just uh, the printed word and things that live in archives, but the creation of spaces that produce the printed word, school settings, um, formal and informal um, reading groups, uh, organizations um, really anticipating some of uh, the issues that someone like Elizabeth McHenry invites us to take seriously, that there are all sorts of pieces to the puzzle of producing a literary work and to think about um, the ways in which people of African descent are engaging uh, those activities. Um, including painting, which uh, I've tried to show elsewhere involved, engaging other kinds of printed materials for the production of new illustrated work. So to really, uh, I hope the volume uh, makes clear for readers that there is um, an unexpected uh, degree of growth and vibrancy in African-American literature of the period before 1830, even though we're still waiting for um, the end of that period to see um, Black periodicals begin to take off. Um, pamphleting is um, really important and William Andrews contributes an essay about that. Um, so yes, the diversity of sources and sources um, defined not just as um, material culture. Um, but sort of piecing together what we know about the era. And I think maybe to, to build off of that, um, that, that we can recover the texts and the authors. And if we do that, then we have to think about recovering the situations and the locations like Jasmine's laid out. Um, and once we gather all of that stuff, we're gonna ev know even more about all of the things that we don't yet know. Um, so recovery is a sort of ongoing process uh, um, and, and one that really has to change everything that we do, right? Change our method, change our narratives, change our sensibilities about American literature and culture. Um, and I, I mean, I, I came out of the working with the volume on reconstruction, really sort of recognizing just how wrong we as historians, as literary scholars, just how wrong we have been about so many things in Reconstruction. Um, and it's because we haven't figured in all of those other voices that uh, uh, got kicked aside. Um, and so I, I, I think that, that one of the contributions that I'm really excited about the series in general, um, but uh, uh, certainly especially about the volume on Reconstruction, is it recovers texts and authors and sites and locations and asks questions and then takes the next step and says, oh, we got this wrong. We need to really, really we need to really rethink the ways in which we've talked about uh, 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 how this period functions and how black textual engagement, um, whether it was oral, written, artistic, um, how that kind of engagement uh, um, shaped the nation, but also could have shaped the nation, um, could have gotten us to a much better place if, if, if we paid attention. I can jump in. <laughs> um, to build on what's already been said and, and to, to also expand upon something that I just touched upon in my earlier comments, I think that one of the what emerged for me from reading the contributions um, to the 1830 to 1850 volume is how, um, and in talking to the contributors, this really happened through, through working with the contributors and fielding their questions and then talking to Joyce Lynn about this, is how this series and the, you know, this volume, but I think the entire series really pushes on whatever boundaries we try to put around the literature. And so while it's a series um, organized chronologically with discrete periodizations for each volume, one of the things that Joycelyn emphasized was to trouble those very boundaries that organize the series. And that's one of the things that um, without prompting uh, many of the contributors to the volume I edited just did. Because when we decided that what we were going to do was look at 
events or institutions and the relationship between an event and the literature, then an event might happen between 1830 uh, and 1850, but its, its impact wasn't limited to literature that was written during that period. And so we have, uh, nor was the literature in that period um, only responding to events that happened in that period. And, and so we have, for example, um, an essay, you know, essay by Nicole Aljo on the impact of uh, West Indian emancipation on poetry that um, occurs in the 1850s and 1860s. So 40s, 50s, and 60s. So, because of course, I mean, we know that, that West Indian emancipation rippled temporally as well as spatially into the literature. And um, there's an, a, a wonderful essay by Nihad Farouk looking at the, the um, relationship between um, the networks of communication, both formal and informal, that were established in the 1830s and um, Harriet Jacobs' Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. So it breaks the boundary of what might go into a volume between 1830 and 1850 when we start to look at relationships rather than discrete texts as the organizing principle, right? But the relationship between an event and a text, then these boundaries, which do exist uh, and are helpful, are there as, as questions rather than answers. And I think that's one of the things that, that um, there's numerous essays uh, throughout the, um, the volume explored. And the, the, the just the, the last thing I'll say is that, that it also happens spatially breaking these boundaries happens spatially or troubling these boundaries. And so the volume is organized around three discrete, in a way, uh, spatial scales, the local, the national, and the transnational. But the essays in each of those sections cross those boundaries. And so you have, for example, the essay that opens the volume by Carla Peterson, exploring how literary society is created in Philadelphia and New York are very much products of Philadelphia and New York, while at the same time are engaged in a national project of African-American literature, African-American culture and, and black modernity and engaging with in that project issues like, oh, I don't know, Scottish enlightenment. You know, so the, both moving back to the 18th century, moving across the, the ocean, moving between cities and nations. And this all happens by looking at the library of one of these associations. You know, and so these, these um, connections emerge by looking closely at the materials. And we might try to establish, I might try to establish discrete boundaries on these materials and these writers, but the materials and the writers resist that. They, they won't allow that to really happen and instead open up much more interesting questions about how these boundaries um, both do exist organizationally, but also need to be crossed and, and troubled. So I think that's one of the, the most powerful insights that, that I gained from, from reading the, the contributions to the volume that I edited. Yeah, and I would, I would add, I guess, that the structure of um, kind of the micro history, like really kind of focusing in on a specific period um, really allowed us in a specific decade, which isn't, there's like kind of conflicting um, impulses here, but by focusing in on a specific period, it wasn't necessarily bound by, you know, the Harlem Renaissance or reconstruction, but 1900 to 1910 is kind of both and in between and anticipating and also, you know, kind of this transitional moment um, from from the, the the years before, but focusing on, on that period of you know that ten year period really allowed I think for attention to all of the kind of nuance and complexity, right? That allowed time to to focus in and say, well, well, what is happening in the publications of um, the Voice of the Negro, and how can we spend time there? How can we spend time in these different spaces as opposed to doing this kind of broad sweeping, you know, kind of generalizations and then moving on? And so I really, I thought that the, the contributors did a great job of kind of spending time um, kind of teasing out 
um, the nuance and teasing out some of those complexities, but then also because, you know, Joycelyn, um, editorial brilliance and helping it guide us and thinking both kind of to the periods before and the periods after, um, being able to connect that, right? Like it's not just kind of valorizing a new set of years, <laughs> you know, but really being able to see like, how is that then, um, even if there's distinct, you know, distinctions, but how is it still in conversation what's happening in the years prior? How is it anticipating? How are there kinds of different origin stories emerging? Um, and I think that really was, was enabled through the kind of structure um, that, that we spent a lot of time kind of talking about and thinking through how to, how to organize that. And I will say we started off thinking that we were going to do it year by year. Um, and, and we, we went down that road for a little bit and we found that it, we just couldn't be contained, right? Like the things that would, would happen in a year were just spilling out. And so we had to kind of broaden that, um, that kind of purview a bit more to be a little more capacious. Um, but in the end, ended up really being able to see the kinds of interrelationships by looking closely in a period, but still being able to kind of zoom out and, and recognize those, those relationships. Yeah, and, and you know, like w one thing that I can add to this as a person who has read all five of your um, volumes that there's this beautiful momentum that happens as we move from one volume to the next volume to the next volume. And I think it's precisely because of what um, y'all are, are all talking about, right? Which is the fact that um, what's happening in your designated um, decades, like it's not just confined to that period. And I think that all of the contributors and e editors did like a, a really great job of really thinking about um, that idea of tra transition, right? So then, um, the conversations that Jasmine is talking about um, and, and, and contributors in the 1800s, 1830 volume, you know, they continue into um, the volume from then and then, you know, those things or whatever carry over into the volume from Teresa. And it's just um, for folks, um, it can be a, a really, really useful, like productive way to approach the series, just like, you know, taking it from the very beginning, right? When that 1750 volume comes out in a couple, which it will in, in, um, in several months, you like start from the beginning and like you can really see the transition and like really track these things over years, over decades and um, centuries. And so in that way, I think like there's this beautiful coherency that happens across the volumes. And there's also a beautiful um, coherency that you achieve within each of the volumes. And I, I could ask a question about that coherency, but I do see that we have a question in the Q&A. So I wanna make sure that we have time to get to that first and then um, if we have more time, I'll come back. Um, so we have a question here from Maria Bellamy. And she's asked, she asked, what were your greatest challenges as editor? How did you manage them? And how did your contributors support your efforts? I'll try. <laughs> that, I mean, I think our sort of biggest challenge as a group of folks um, was that there's just so much, right? Um, and, and within that so much, there's so much that we have not talked about. And, and so much of that has deeply shaped today and is still deeply shaping today. And so even as we were writing about reconstruction, we were consistently reminding ourselves that we're still in reconstruction and it's still not working, right? Um, and I, I, I'll be honest, I, I, I'm a little bit hesitant to go first on this because um, usually I like to wait because um, one of the things that this volume reminded me of um, that I thought for a long, long time is that um, it would be really valuable if more white folks would shut up and listen to black and brown folks before speaking and acting. Um, and and. I keep thinking about this specifically within the context of reconstruction, right? And so I think this was a consistent problem for us. What would the 1860s and 1870s have looked like if white folks, especially white reformers, had actually listened to what black folks were saying or Indian folks were saying or Chinese folks or Latinx folks? I, I mean, think about it. 
why is it such a radical notion to suggest that folks who had been enslaved might know a lot more about how to end chattel slavery than anybody else? And so I, I think that sense of there's just so much that we need to study and that we need to listen to and that we need to learn. Um, and, and I don't know whether we um, solve that problem together. Um, I can tell you that my contributors did not help me at all with that because they were the same way, if more so, right? They wanted to talk about more stuff. Uh, um, and, and so I think that the way that we sort of all worked that out was that we came to these uneasy compromises, right? Okay, we'll talk about this now, and this could be a spinoff article someplace else, um, or this could be the next thing that we do. Um, and I think the contributors, to my volume at least, uh, to our volume at least, um, really sort of theorized what a whole bunch of other volumes would look like. Um, and so we're excited to see what that is next. Um, but I think that was really the biggest problem, that there's so much um, and that we're barely scratching the surface. Yeah, I would second um, what Eric has said. And um, I think one of the ways that we addressed that, like there was um, a desire to be representative in a certain way to make sure things, you know, that, that so many things were represented, you know, like we would have, you know, we don't want to make, we don't want to lose this particular um, area or this particular viewpoint. And like, how do we kind of make sure that we can represent that? And I think of kind of letting that go at some point, um, like it really is way too, <laughs> you know, way too expansive to be representative and, and being, um, recognizing as I think the entire series does the iterativeness of the process, right? That this, that just like, you know, we look at each decade and we look at each volume and the, the ideas that get um, advanced and then they get taken up and they get revised, you know, and I think in the volume seeing our own um, contributions to African-American literary culture and thinking about it as part of that process. And I was gonna, I was thinking to mention when you, we were talking about contributions of our volumes and, and being able to do these micro histories. And um, one of the great contributions that that yielded, I think was this ability to, to have the voices, I think to Eric's point of so many of the authors, bibliographers, publishers, artists, intellectuals, articulating what they were imagining their work doing. You know, this is what we're imagining. You know, Du Bois, as Laura Helton's article talks about, um, Du Bois and Daniel Murray are, are taught, what is an African-American literature? They're having this conversation and it's not finished and it's not complete, you know, but they, this, so we are, we are part of that process. You know, we're part of that process of keeping this conversation going. Um, and I think, rec I mean, that's the expanse of being able to go from a method that recognizes the expansiveness as part of the process rather than trying to kind of close it down and delimit it and, and, and finish it off. So, yeah, but it, it does make for editorial challenges. <laughs> um, any, any thoughts, Jasmine or Finn? Yeah, um, I'm thinking about this question and anticipating the next a bit in my answer. But I, I think uh, to re reiterate what's been said is that once you, once I got started, once I signed on as editor, I had to really um, contend with that African-American cultural production of the period I chose was so capacious that any kind of boundaries I would try to put around it would be not only fabricated, but hard to, you know, hold hold as true for the length of the volume that, um, you know, so I, my volume um, sort of divides the sections according to organizational writing, movement and mobility, print culture, circulation, and visual art. And then I uh, solicited contributions and someone like David Walker could easily appear in all four sections of the volume taken up by different authors, right? That his uh, writing um, 
to speak to the, the next question in the Q&A, uh, Maurice Wallace contributes a beautiful essay about um, Walker uh, and the sermon, um, right? So that the, the importance of um, religious thinking and writing in the period is really encapsulated in what Walker does. And yet the issue of movement and mobility is relevant to what Walker does because he's essentially on the run uh, his his text circulates as far south uh, as Virginia. And so the question of print circulation, uh, African-American print circulation, troubling an easy distinction between North and South. Um, and then although we yet to find a, a portrait representation of Walker, um, the, the pamphlet itself is visual material right, becomes important as well. So I think there was a real trickiness as well as pleasure to thinking about the period and how uh, African-American um, writing of the period as variously defined um, did so many things, both for African-Americans and people not identified as African-Americans that it, it couldn't be um, held to a simple distinction of writing for politics sake or writing for um, pleasure's sake, but it, it really does so much then and uh, ongoing to Eric's point um, that it, it, I, I think for all of us, um, it was really um, a, a, an important challenge to our thinking and hopefully to others as well to think about um, how and why we have to put structures around um, the writing of these periods and then how we can do away with them as well once we start to engage the text. I'm excited to read each of these other volumes, seeing um, the table of contents here for the first time. I just wanted to say real, real quick, um, I hope it'll be real quick. I'll try real, real hard to make it real quick. I think that um, this second part of that question of, or third part, how did your contributors support your efforts? I mean, to me, the contributors were the, the solution to all my problems. Um, you know, that, and this came from um, Eric Gardner uh, very, very early on in the process. I think when I, maybe before I even said yes to Joycelyn, although I was gonna say yes, because when Joycelyn asks someone to do something, I think they say yes. Um, that's my, my opinion, at least. Um, but uh, I you know, knew Eric and, and knew that he'd done a lot of editorial work, which I, I had not, and asked um, for any advice. And he said, remember that your contributors are doing you a favor. And I take that to heart, um, you know, that the contributors are the heart of the volume. They are doing the lion's share of the work um, and it doesn't exist <laughs> with just an editor's name on it. Um, and, and so uh, any problems I had, they, they solved um, through conversation, through collaboration. Uh, I was looking at that comment that, that, that came up in the Q&A that talked about the collaborative process. And so when we had you know, questions about where are the boundaries and then the contributors just broke them and then we just went, okay, let's just break them and, and you know, we'll figure it out uh, together. Um, but I think my greatest challenge was getting started and finding and securing that, that group of contributors. And then once that was done, then everything, I mean, there's tons of work, but it, it all was doable. Once there was a community there, um, you know, when it was just a sort of proposal on a piece of paper, it seemed very daunting. But once there were other people involved, um, and, and, and once people started to say yes to my emails, <laughs> asking them to contribute, Nicole Alger was the first person to say yes. When Nicole Alger said yes, I was like, oh, the volume will happen. Someone will actually write for it. Um, and that's a really great feeling and, and made it possible. So it, it really was a, about um, not trying to do any of it alone, you know, but very much being in touch with a, a group as people who were um, making it all possible, not whose people it is my job as an editor to manage in some way, but to let go of that and, and instead think about facilitating and, and helping and, and, and that sort of community. And that, again, not a model I came up with. That's something that other people taught me how to do, but it really, um, really was, was the only way this worked. 
thank you so much um for for that insight y'all and, and and i should probably say too that that the person um, maria asking that question is actually working on the final volume in the series um right now so she was asking um you know um for for very specific reasons and thank you jasmine for addressing um um, a little bit of the, the second question in the Q&A that unfortunately we won't be able to get to because um, we are arriving at the top of the hour. But I would like to just take a moment just to read the question just so that we have it out there and people can um, take it with them. Um, the question is from Cynthia Patterson. It says, could each volume editor say a little bit about how the literature emanating from the Black Protestant religious um, press is represented in your volume? And I can just say really quickly, that it is rep represented across um, the volumes ve very much, um, particularly in the 19th century. And that's one of those things that I was talking about before that gives um, the series such a nice momentum is that there is in particular a really nice tracking of how the black, um, the black religious press is helping to um, shape and is being shaped by an African-American literary tradition. Um, we got a couple minutes left. I see Ray is on the screen right now. Um, so I, 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 so I know that we are um, co coming up to the conclusion. Um, is there anybody who has like a final burning comment that you have to get out there, or else you won't be able to sleep tonight? If not, then we're going to turn it over to Ray, who is um, the editor at Cambridge, so that he can um, have a couple concluding remarks for us. Thank you very much for you know, an enthralling hour. It's been absolutely fascinating and humbling uh, to listen to everyone and to, to hear the issues, the intellectual issues raised. Um, if I could just focus on one as representative, it was absolutely, um, it was just so good to hear what Eric said about thinking again about reconstruction, because that's what myself and Joycelyn uh, tried to set out when we planned this about six years ago, offer a new platform, a new genre, that could ask different questions about um, established issues. So to hear that you were able to think anew about something as, as crucial as reconstruction, it was just, just fantastic, you know, and, and, and you know, it makes it all worthwhile. But look, I, I actually, my job here is to formally thank everybody on behalf of CUP, but I can't say anything that uh, Cassie has said much more eloquently than me. She, she's ticked all the boxes and she, she said it better than I can. We stand on the shoulders of giants uh, Mary, Ever, Mary Emma and Jerry with Cambridge History of African American Literature. I still look back on that project with such fondness and, and such warmth. Um, they cleared a path that we followed here. The contributors for all the unseen and silent work behind the scenes that you've done to make this po project possible. Thank you so much to the volume editors. Um, herding, you know, uh, 25 contributors in each volume into some coherent shape, takes an awful lot of work. Th thank you so much uh, for that. Every email, every communication from Professor Cassandra, Cassandra Smith moves the project along. She's always unfailingly efficient, driven to the point. She gets it, as you heard from her understanding and summation of the project. We are deeply indebted to her for everything that she's brought to the project. And it's, it's a case of her in, intellectual resources, but also her personality and her, her, her sense of herself as a human being as well. It's just been inc incredibly enjoyable um, uh, to work with her. And Joycelyn, she's here. She's like the Holy Spirit or the narrator in Ulysses, everywhere but unseen. You know, what, what, what can I say? You, you've all said it better than, than I can. It took a lot of intellectual courage to embark on this. It took a little bit from me. It took a bit more from CUP, but it took an awful lot from Joycelyn. And this wasn't my original plan. You know, it was more modest. It was Joycelyn who persuaded me uh, to go down this route. And I'm really, really glad that she did because this is a moment of celebration. It's a moment of joy. It's a humbling moment, you know, it's a moving moment. We had a practice session last week and Joycelyn gave us a rousing call to remind ourselves of the stakes um, in the wider world for the African-American community, which I don't need to remind us, you know, everybody on, on this screen uh, uh, about. Um, we hope that this project pushes the world in, in, in the right direction. But CUP is enormously honored and proud to have this project on its list. There'll be five more volumes coming later this year, and we'll be, I'm sure, quickly uh, finishing the rest 
um, shortly after that with uh, Cassie's inimitable drive and Joycelyn's uh, vision. But to everybody, sincere thanks for everything that you've done. Um, we are, you know, hugely in your debt.